Namaste, everyone. I pray to the divinity within you. We are continuing with the Tripura Rahasya. We are now on chapter 22. To briefly summarize the previous chapter, Lord Dathatraya narrated a story to Parshurama. The story was about a prince and a Brahmin ghost. The ghost of a Brahmin asks a prince, a realized prince, many questions. And on receiving these answers, all his questions are resolved and he is freed from a curse and becomes a Brahmin again. This Brahmin is called Basuman. Basuman has still many questions to ask and he poses these questions to the prince. <clears throat> In this chapter, chapter 22, Vasuman poses these questions again and the prince answers him. So we will continue with chapter 22 of the Tripura Rahasya. After listening to the story of the Brahma Rakshasa, Parshurama asked his master, the Tatraya, with great reverence, Lord, what did that Brahmin ask after he was freed from the curse? And what was Hemangada's answer? Kindly let me know. I am curious. It could not have been a mere debate. <clears throat> At his request, the compassionate Dattatraya replied, Parshurama, that dialogue was profound and deep. I will tell you. Basuman asked the prince who was sitting nearby. Prince, I want to ask something. Can you please explain? In the beginning, I received this knowledge from the sage Ashtavakra. After hearing you, I now understand how to attain the highest state of knowledge? How can a person who has known what ought to be known continue interacting with the world? It is like the coexistence of darkness and light. Prince, please explain the reason clearly. So we hear the Parshurama is very curious about this questions that were posed by the Brahmin to the prince Hemangara. It's not an idle curiosity. It's not just inquisitive. This is the spirit of inquiry. A true seeker does not rest until he has found satisfactory answers and has resolved all his questions. So, this spirit of inquiry is seen throughout the scripture, and not just this scripture, but many scriptures. Because many of the scriptures, such as the Bhagavad Gita, are also in the form of question and answer. A true seeker asks the teacher, the teacher replies. And this teacher is not a merely learned person, but a realized person, one who has realized his true nature. So, Parshurama says, I want to know. I'm curious. This could not have been a mere debate. So, he felt the intensity of this dialogue between the young prince, the self-realized prince, and the Brahmin, that this was not a just a superficial intellectual discussion, but something very deep, something very profound. And he wanted to have a part of that. When Dattatraya starts to narrate the story, he says, Vasuman asked the prince who was sitting nearby. Vasuman the Brahmin questioned his teacher 
the self-realized prince who was sitting nearby. There is a great deal of emphasis on these words, sitting nearby. This is exactly what the word Upanishad means. Upanishad means one sitting nearby. Two teachings happen in the presence of a teacher who you sit close to. Over here, I would like to emphasize that this is not merely physical presence. Sitting in the physical presence of a teacher is surely a great thing and a wonderful and beautiful experience. But you all know that you can be physically close to a person, but mentally miles away from that person. You cannot reach sometimes certain people. You may have experienced this in your life when you met somebody, you were very close physically to that person, you were talking to this person, but the ideas, the thinking, the attitude of this person may have been so far away that this person could have well been at the other end of the planet and it would not have made a difference. So when we talk about sitting close, being close, a physical presence is always a good thing, but we also speak of being close, vibrating at the same level, resonating together, feeling that person in thought, mind, heart, spirit. And when that happens, we all know this, that we, we meet certain people and we have never met them before, but within a few moments, you just click. Something happens and you just enjoy this person's company and you have not met this person before. On the other hand, there are people you know since years. You may be acquaintances since years, but you still don't really have that joy. So we are referring here not merely to someone sitting physically close, but Upanishad also means being close, resonating at that same level. And such teachers then can be accessed once you develop that relationship with the teacher. It doesn't matter where your teacher is. The teacher could be at the other end of the world. Because once you resonate with the teacher, that teacher can guide you. This is referring to the external guru. And such teachers can then also teach in silence. Because whether you sit then close to the teacher physically or you're apart, it doesn't matter. Because you are no longer communicating with mere words. But through a stream of knowledge. You may have experienced this yourself when you met somebody you loved dearly. You felt madly in love with someone. And then all you want to be is close to this person. You do not exchange words. You just want to sit with this person, look at the person, maybe hold hands with this person, your loved one, just be there. And you communicate in silence. That love that you feel for this person flows through you and you also feel the love of that other person flowing to you. And this is a kind of communication in silence, which is the deepest level. And this is what is referred to as teachings in silence. It doesn't mean that you go just to some seminar, some retreat, you just sit there quietly. You don't connect with the teacher, you don't know the teacher, you have no f attraction or feeling for this person. And you say, oh, I, these are t teachings in silence. The teachings in silence happen when you are able to receive these teachings and that happens when you resonate at that level with the teacher.
So the prince is asked by Vasuman, How can one who has known everything that is to be known continue interacting in the world? Having known everything, your purpose of life has been fulfilled. So is the thinking of all seekers and you wonder why would such a person want to continue to be in this world? Is an enlightened person does not does that mean that he leaves his body consciously and he's gone? He's not available to us. Can such a person continue to interact with the world? It's a very valid question and it is well put because the, the Brahmin says this is like the coexistence of darkness and light. We all know that when you enter a dark room and you switch on the light, the darkness is gone. Darkness and light cannot coexist. And so, Vasuman, the Brahmin, has not quite understood this. How can a realized master or a jani continue to live in the world? And he requests the prince, Prince, please explain the reason clearly. Why is this so? I continue reading from verse 9 of chapter 22. At his request, the prince spoke, O Brahmin, your confusion is not yet completely removed. How can the knowledge identical with one's own self be negated by worldly activity? If knowledge can be negated by living in the world, then that knowledge is no more valuable than a dream. All worldly activity has its basis in knowledge. So how can knowledge be negated? Please tell me. Knowledge is that through which the entire universe is seen. Through some kalp, firm determination, all worldly activities seem to remain to appear within knowledge itself. When one becomes desireless and knows Atman, then the individual soul attains freedom from all bondage and enjoys happiness. O Brahman, therefore, your question is invalidated by wise men. So the prince's response to this is, what kind of knowledge is that that is negated by worldly activity? It is very poor knowledge if you think that you can no longer live in the world and that the world is something to be contemptuous about, of, that the world is to be rejected, that the world is a terrible place. If that is the knowledge you have attained and acquired, then it is very poor knowledge indeed. It is no more real than a dream. The truth is that deep, profound knowledge will transform you so completely, bring such powerful light and wisdom into your life that it will shed this light even in the external world. You will see things clearly and it will remove all suffering. And so such a person can continue to live in this world as well. He is Jivan Mukt. He has been freed in this lifetime. That is what Jivan Mukta means. Continue reading from verse 15, chapter 22. Vasuman said to the kind-hearted prince, Sir, this is true. I have arrived at the same conclusion myself. Pure consciousness is called pure knowledge. 
After attaining enlightenment and experiencing pure consciousness, someone still has desires. He will still be deluded exactly the way a rope can be mistaken for a snake. Mistaken identity is illusion. So now Vasuman, he's, he claims, oh yeah, I also came to the same conclusion. <laughs> and um, one of the conclusions is, is correct. He says, pure consciousness is pure knowledge. This is quite contrary to some of the ideas that are put forward by conventional wisdom. The idea is that knowledge is something about reading books, gathering information. That is not knowledge. That is, that is information. That is, at the most, you can call it book knowledge. But that is not true knowledge. It's not pure knowledge. It's not the highest knowledge. The highest knowledge comes from experience, direct experience. And that has to be integrated. And we know that when <clears throat> you have an operation of some kind, you have a physical problem and you need to go to a surgeon, would you go to a surgeon who has only read books on an anatomy? He has no experience, has never practiced surgery on a cadaver before, on a corpse. And this is a purely theoretical knowledge that he has. Would you allow such a surgeon to perform surgery on you? I don't think so. I wouldn't, and I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't either. So, true knowledge is through direct experience. Which is why also when you study for a profession, for example, law, or any other profession like engineering, IT, anything, you may have a certain background in it, but ultimately, you need to go in the world and practice, and it takes many years for us to acquire certain skills because we did not learn these at university, in college, or school. These come only through experience. So, pure consciousness is pure knowledge. The highest knowledge, what we seek, is not book knowledge but ultimate self-realization, enlightenment, or identifying and being established in pure consciousness itself. So Vasuman still has some doubts and he says, but if you have attained enlightenment, if you have experienced pure consciousness, but you still have desires, then then this is like a rope being mistaken for a snake. The, th this is a mistaken identity. This is an illusion. So he's still not convinced that the Ajivan Mukt can interact with the world. He thinks that Ajivan Mukt then has desires. That is why he's here. Continues to live in the world. He is still in his mind has doubts because he's thinking of the, the dark room example where he thinks, hmm, if I switch on the light, then the darkness should go away. But ask yourself, when the darkness goes away, do you throw all the furniture out? Do you want to stay in an empty room? No, you use the furniture and you're able to use it better. You're able to find your way around better. Somebody walking around in the dark, bumps, falls, hurts himself. But you switch on the light so you can see clearly what is where. And you don't mistake the things lying on the floor for snakes and start panicking. You know, okay, something's fallen there. Maybe it's, it's a, a pillow. <laughs> Let me pick it up and put it back on my bed. Because you can see your bed. It's not dark in the room and
we see that one who has switched on the light in the room can see better, can use all the things in that room in a much more effective way than somebody who would be sitting in the dark all the time. But let us see what the prince has to say. How does the prince respond to this question from the Brahmin, which clearly shows that he has still not understood that he still has doubts? I'm reading from chapter 17, sorry, um, verse 17, chapter 22. The prince replied, Brahmin, listen. You do not know how to distinguish confusion from non-confusion. Those who know the sky is colorless still perceive it as blue and use the words, the sky is blue. The fact that they see and speak this way does not mean they have any illusions about the color of the sky. In this verse... The prince really hits the nail on the head. It's very clear that a lot of the time we use certain language in a certain way. For example, at night it is dark and we might say, oh, the sun is not shining. But that's not true. The sun is always shining. It just does not happen to be shining on us at this point of time. But next morning it will. But the fact is, the sun is shining all the time. We say the sun is rising, the sun is setting, but that's also an illusion. The fact is, the sun neither rises nor sets. It's just the earth that's revolving around the sun, which creates that illusion. Uh, And, of course, the earth... uh, rotating on its own axis that creates that illusion. So we are aware of these facts, but we still use these terms. The sun is rising, the sun is setting, the sun is not shining when it's raining. Of course the sun is shining when it's raining. It's just that there are clouds which block our view of the sun. We cannot see the sun. But of course, the sun is shining. And that does not mean that we are deluded. It's just a way of speaking. Verse 19. To the ignorant, it is confusion. Whereas to the knower of truth, it is not. A realized person's knowledge cannot be the source of bondage any more than a dead snake can bite. So he says that once you have attained this realization, it will will transform you and it, it will not become a source of bondage. Keeping in the mind our dark room example, that when you switch on the light, you don't throw the furniture out, sit in an empty room, but in fact... You enjoy the furniture, you enjoy everything which is in that room. So if it's a dining room, there's wonderful food, you can enjoy that food. You're in the living room, you enjoy all the things in the living room, including your TV and your music or whatever you have in your room. You read books, maybe you get a book off the shelf and you can read a book. The dark, you cannot do these things. So it is very clear that the one who has this profound self-knowledge of pure consciousness, the whole world lights up and he can really truly enjoy the world. He does not need to then just reject the world because he is enlightened. In fact, only those who are enlightened can truly enjoy the world. The rest do not enjoy the world. They are suffering and miserable, just like the person who is stumbling and bumbling in the dark, trying to eat in the dark, (laughs) trying to read in the dark, and struggling because these things are not really very easy to do in the dark. (laughs) 
verses 20 onwards. Now the prince goes on to explain the different levels of journeys. So verse 20 says, There is certainly a difference between the worldly interactions and behaviors of a journey and an ignorant person. The journey's interactions with the world are like images in a mirror. So verse 20 again now says very clearly, Yes, once a person is enlightened, he is not the same as the other. It doesn't mean he has to leave the world. He doesn't have to depart the world, nor has he to reject the world. But his behavior will be different. For him, the world is just like images in the mirror. When you look at all the things in the mirror, you see everything. They're all images, but they're not real. They're just reflections. So he sees the world then like images in a mirror. He knows they're not real, but he enjoys them. And he explains further than the three levels of Janis. Verses 21 onwards. In the case of a Jani, the knowledge related to his dealings with the world is valid. While in the case of an ignorant person, it is otherwise. All the Jani's activities are based on knowledge. Because Jani's are constantly aware that all actions and interactions with the world are like images reflecting in a mirror, they are free from ignorance. That which is born out of ignorance can be dispelled by knowledge. That which is born out of ignorance cannot furnish the means of attaining knowledge. That is why a diseased person has double vision. This vision is seen, sorry, the world is seen as it is because of past karmas. All the experiences of the world come from one's own karmas. Therefore, as long as these karmas and their subtle impressions are not destroyed, interaction with the world continues. The moment all karmas are exhausted, there exists only pure consciousness. Thus, confusion can never arise from pure knowledge. So we see that all our interactions with the world, our experiences, are born out of karma, samskaras, which are stored in the mind. And it's like a filter. <clears throat> you don't see things clearly anymore because things are tainted. If you've been bitten by a dog, you will see every dog with suspicion. You will view a dog with suspicion. So it could be a really cute dog, very small, cute. But you are afraid that it's going to snap because you have that past experience. So you begin to see dogs, not as cute little cuddly puppies or, or sweet little things, but you begin to see them as small little monsters who can bite. The opposite is also true. If you've had very positive experiences with dogs, little puppies and cute little things, <laughs> then you will approach every dog like he's a cute little cuddly thing. When in fact, they may not be cute and cuddly. Maybe they are very uh, aggressive dogs and so it would be smart not to go try to pet every single dog you see and um, this is the coloring that comes from past karmas experiences and these form impressions in the mind called samskaras and everything that we see is colored by these samskaras so you're not seeing the world as it is, you're seeing it through a filter, through a lens, a colored lens. So coming back to our dark room example, it's not completely dark maybe, but it, the light is very fuzzy and hazy. Sometimes the light is green, sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's bright, sometimes it's very dull. And in parts there are dark corners, so your, your room is, is really very unclear. You, you can't see things too clearly. And 
you need to switch on that big light so that the entire room is flooded with light and you can see clearly. Not just through kind of little spotlights, you know, here and there and little patches in the dark and little little light in corners, but really flood the room with light. And Once the room is flooded with light, you will find your way around. You, it's no problem. It's like daylight. You flood the room with light. So the problems or the ignorance that comes, comes from all these past actions and this is the filter of these subtle impressions which are not destroyed. And the moment these samskaras are destroyed, there is only pure consciousness. Now, I would like to repeat the sentence here from verse 25. The moment all karmas are exhausted, there exists only pure consciousness. This happens with the Jivan Mukta. Once that process has started, he has seen the light, so to say, but the, the karmas, the action has not been completed. He will explain this further as we go along in the chapter. But there exists only then pure consciousness. And as long as these karmas are not exhausted, a Jivan Mukth Jani will continue to interact with the world. Verse 27 onwards. Hearing this, the Brahmin asked the prince, O oh prince, how can action possibly be performed by a Jani? How is a jani able to perform actions when the fire of knowledge burns all karmas? The prince replied, Brahman, there are three kinds of karmas. A pakva, which is unripe, pakva, that is ripe, and hatodita. Hatodita is destroyed, um, karmas that are destroyed before they germinate. For Janis, all karmas are destroyed, except for the ripe ones. Some of you might find the resemblance to the explanations of samskaras and karma and samskaras in the Yoga Sutras. In the Yoga Sutras, they are called latent, that is the unripe or apakva. It's also called latent. Then there are active samskaras, like here we call them pakva. Then there are those that are destroyed before germination. Here it is called hatodita. And in the Yoga Sutras we talk about roasted seeds. Roasted seeds cannot germinate. In the Yoga Sutras there is another category, the fourth category, and that is attenuated. That means those through practice and awareness have become milder. They are not so strong and not so dominant anymore. And they have been reduced in their power and that is attenuated. Verse 30, Providence or nature, Niyati, has appointed time as the riper. The karmas that are ripe are called pakva. A pakva karmas are not yet ripe. A karma that are performed after self-realization are not binding. Ripe karmas are also called prarabdha karmas. They are like arrows already sent toward their target. They keep moving towards their target until the force impelling them is exhausted. For those of you who are a little bit familiar with Upanishads, they have heard of this example of the archer shooting arrows towards a target. And he has arrows also in his quill. So some are inside, 
some he takes out and has shot. So those that have already been shot, they're already heading towards the target. You cannot call it back. It's gone. So such karma is called prarabdha karma or pakva karma, ripe karma. It's already done. It's a done thing. You cannot bring it back. So it has to, it will come to an end at some point of time. Then it loses its momentum. It will arrive there and then it's done. Those that are in the quill still, they have not been shot. They have not been fired. These are the unripe apakva. And so these karmas, you can choose not to put them out in the world. So the karma of the Jivan Mukt has already, what has already been put out in the world will continue until that force which is impelling them is exhausted. And here, very often, the example given is that of a potter's wheel. Once the pot has been made on the wheel and the pot has been removed, the wheel still keeps turning until after some time it stops on its own. So also the karma of a Jivan Mukt will run out of steam or it will just be exhausted after a while and then such a person has really no more action to do in the world. Verse 33. The experience of worldly knowledge continues for the journey because of his resulting karma, but his response depends on the degree of his knowledge. The journey still undergoes the results of his previous actions. His reaction to them depends on his degree of realization. So now we are heading into that section where the prince Hemangada explains to Vasuman, the Brahman, about the three levels of journeys. Now, I'm sure that those of you who have been listening to this commentary on the Tripura Rasya may have noticed that it's not uncommon <laughs> in this story for very unconventional situations to take place. So we had a princess teaching a prince. So we know how society is and it is in general unusual for the wife to teach the husband or for a woman teacher to teach the man. And in a patriarchal society, this would be frowned upon. Most scriptures have male teachers as the heroes, whether it is in the East or in the West. And this scripture is um, very unusual and very progressive. It's a tantric scripture and has um, no gender bias. And so we see uh, some female teachers. You even have the goddess Tripura, um, Sundari herself, teaching, teaching male deities and male gods, uh, Brahma, Vishnu and uh, Shiva, who had to come to her <laughs> for guidance. We have a king who is teaching Brahmin. Here we have a prince who is also teaching a Brahmin. And so there's also not the, this caste or status um, preferences being made here. And um, we see that a warrior 
and a prince uh, can also teach a Brahmin who is a, uh, normally the custodian of ritual knowledge. And uh, this also makes it clear that the Brahmins are not custodians of yogic knowledge and tradition, but of ritual knowledge and ritual traditions. So many unusual uh, roles here, um, very interesting, which also give us clues that at the highest level of realization, all these things, culture, status, education, gender, all these things are irrelevant. Age, for example, age is irrelevant. So you have a young um, yogi teaching an older man or woman. So all these general biases that we have are all destroyed. So verses 34 onwards. The prince begins to describe the three levels of jhanis. There is the lowest level, there's the second level, and then there's the highest level. So three levels of jhanis are to be described here. He goes into a fair amount of detail. So let us begin with the first level. For the lowest level jhani, the result of karma is instant and very clear. For the second level jhani, karmic fruits are insignificant. The highest jhani, however, remains unaffected by the fruits of his karma, for he knows it is not any more real than a rabbit's horns. That is why the highest jhanis are said to be free from the bondage of karma. Prior to the performance of an action, the ignorant anticipate the entire sequence and its consequences. This is how they bind themselves with the strands of karma. Okay, so now we have three levels, or rather four. <laughs> First are the ignorant. And the ignorant are very clear that they want to have certain fruit of the action. So whatever they do, they do with a certain objective in mind and so if they work they work for money no, it's selfish and um, there is not this selfless approach to the action they perform for the lowest level of jhani on the other hand it's very clear that certain action is going to bring certain results he begins to understand what kind of results are coming out of what kind of action you can see the long-term effects of that an ignorant person does not always understand the long-term effects of his action and sometimes performs action that is also very self-destructive and that leads to a great deal of suffering increasing the suffering so that is why we say that when we start on the path, it's very important to organize one's life so that you minimize certain problems that occur merely because you have not been able to understand the long-term effects of your actions. So for the lowest level of jhani, the result of the karma is very clear. For the second level, these fruits or whatever the result is, He's not too bothered by it. It's there, fine. But for the third level of journey, he knows this is all an illusion. He knows it and he is totally untouched by this. If he wants to perform the action, he does it. If he doesn't want to, he doesn't do it. It's like walking through a house of mirrors. In the house of mirrors, you see yourself sometimes long, sometimes fat, sometimes distorted. And, you know, you may laugh about it. It's all very funny. 
But imagine if you were really suddenly looking distorted. You would not like that. If you really look distorted, <laughs> with your face all twisted up. But for Johnny, everything is like walking through a house of mirrors because he sees everywhere only reflections of things. And like when we would go in the house of mirrors and you find some object there, and you don't know which is the real object and which is actually the reflection, you get confused. But for the Johnny, it doesn't matter which is the real object and which is the reflection because ultimately everything is an illusion. So you can imagine that such a person is very difficult to relate to because he sees the world in a completely different way and the ignorant might project some of their ideas onto him and they would say, hey, uh, you should work and earn lots of money. You're so intelligent. Why, is, why are you just walking around here wasting your time? And the Johnny, this doesn't matter. Um, having to achieve something or certain ideas what he has to do, what he doesn't have to do. These are all ideas being imposed on him and he's not bothered because he's free. He doesn't accept all these suggestions from society. And this makes people in the society around him very uneasy, very uncomfortable, because they don't understand a person who remains totally unaffected by extreme wealth or extreme pain or suffering. So the highest Johnny is free from the bondage of karma by the ignorant. They actually bind themselves with the strands of karma. They actually do that. They are binding themselves with the strands of karma rather than freeing themselves. The lowest level Johnny makes an effort to contemplate the self so his preoccupation with the results of his action is broken from time to time. For this result, for this reason, the result of his karma is not very powerful. So the lowest level journey, he makes a great deal of effort to withdraw from the world. And um, he needs to practice Vairagya. He needs to practice this. He is not, it doesn't come effortlessly for him. So every now and then he needs to contemplate and so that the result of the, the karma doesn't keep coming back to him. He, he's not remain, getting bound further and pulled into this, sucked into this whirlpool of karma and samskaras. So to, he has to remain afloat somehow. In order to do that, he needs to Contemplate. He need, needs to make an effort every time. The middle level, Johnny, he doesn't need to make an effort. Now, for him, it is pretty much effortless. And, but he does experience some of the karma. He experiences as a, that is bhoga. He experiences something, the, the, the fruit of this action. But it's very, it's like a person in deep sleep experiences a mosquito bite. The discomfort is minimal. So we see the lowest level makes an effort and he has to keep repeating this effort. The middle level is effortless but he still experiences some of this pain and suffering. But like a person who in deep sleep gets bitten by a mosquito. In deep sleep when you're bitten by a mosquito <clears throat> Unconsciously, you, you know, you push away the mosquito, you um, protect yourself from this mosquito. But if you're in very deep sleep, you may still not wake up. And so you, you may not experience the pain of that mosquito bite. And so it is with a journey of the second level. He doesn't experience the suffering like most ignorant people do. He is 
it's like he's in deep sleep and he's bitten by a mosquito so the, the, the suffering is very minimal however verse 39 however for the highest type of journey even the full fruit of his action are like nothing at all for they've been burned by the power the fire of knowledge for him those karmas lose their binding power like an actor performing in a drama who plays his role without being affected by the sorrow or delight he experiences on the stage the highest journey remains unaffected by even the full effect of his ripe karma therefore his karmic fruit is as illusionary as the horn of a rabbit so we see that in this highest journey is a true witness is a true witness and he is the, the full force of that karma can come to him but for him it's nothing it's just like a drama he is there he is acting out his role he's doing whatever his job is but he is totally unaffected by what is happening to him and he remains unaffected this is why sometimes we have had cases of great journeys um great masters being tortured being crucified for example by others because they spoke the truth without fear they were fearless and it didn't go down very well with the others and so they got that full force of their action back in the form of torture or whatever but they just went through it because they were witnessing they did not experience that suffering the way a normal person experiences the suffering it's like an actor playing a role the actor does not experience the suffering similarly here the great masters who have been tortured crucified um harmed in many ways um you think oh my what kind of suffering they went through but the fact is that um they were witnessing this just as an actor plays his role in a drama the ignorant on the other hand they do not have pure knowledge and they continuously identify themselves with the body and they think everything all these worldly objects are real so these three levels of journeys are compared with the ignorant and you see for the ignorant who is identified with his body and with the worldly objects around him this is extreme suffering and so they cannot understand how you are not attached how you could be maybe not interested now this does not mean that a journey is actually cold loveless disinterested in you or you know has no feelings this the journey is overflowing with compassion is just not that kind of attachment love that you call love it's attachment it's not that kind of <laughs> um attachment that you call love it's a different kind of love it's a love that sets you free and we don't recognize this often as love because we don't know it we rarely have had this kind of experience of this kind of love we know only attachment and we call that attachment love if given it that name but this highest form of love is floods the highest level of jani and so he is not cold and emotionless he is full of love he is love itself it's full of compassion it's just that the ordinary person does not understand this compassion it's like a mother who um 
needs to take care of her child. She's very loving, but every now and then the child may need a scolding, may need to be disciplined. That's also love. Love is not just the cuddling and the hugging and the kissing. Love is also the discipline. It's a different kind of love, but it is love. And so this compassion, compassionate love of a journey is often not understood by people around him or her and is mistaken for something else. So continues the discussion about the three levels of jhanis um, further. So it is probably good to stop here at this point and continue with this chapter, this very last chapter, which is a very, very profound and deep chapter next time, which will be our very last session of this detailed commentary of the Tripura Rahasya. We are ending this commentary today at verse 42 of chapter 22. We will continue our next session with verse 43 onwards and we will end our commentary of the Tripura Rahasya. What we will do is also eventually uh, do sessions on the gems of the Tripura Rahasya. This means that we will not go through the entire Tripura Rasya once again, but we will take up the salient points, what the scripture is putting forward as uh, solutions or as uh, principles or guide, guiding principles on this internal journey. Thank you for listening and we meet again next time. Bye-bye, everybody.